Artists also explore the impact of global <laughs> borders. Transport and trade has opened up new possibilities for moving between borders, and many people leave their place of birth by choice or by force in search of new opportunities or to escape war, conflict and political oppression. I personally have moved from Australia to the UK. Having been born and lived in the same city for my entire life, it has been a challenge for me to redefine my concept of what home is. Is it a familiarity with a physical space? Does it extend beyond the front door? Does it mean an intimate familiarity with streets and buildings? Is it the people, known and unknown, connected by common threads of language, context, local knowledge and culture? Where do you live? Is it where you do most of your living or just where you sleep? Is it possible to have more than one home or none at all? Through his fabric installations, Korean artist Doho Su investigates the meaning of home in a global world of travel and migration. According to the artist, at some point in your life, you have to leave your home. And whenever you go back, it's just not the same home anymore. I think home is something that you carry along with your life. It's something that you can repeat over and over again. This is exactly what he set out to achieve with his 1999 installation piece, Seoul Home slash LA Home slash New York Home slash Baltimore Home slash London Home slash Seattle Home, etc. Named after all the cities in which it has been exhibited, the work is a replica of the interior of his parents' house in Seoul. Made from silk, this is a life-size sculpture and it's folded up and transported from home to home. What do you think the significance is of the artist's choice of silk as a material? Pause here to discuss. According to the artist, the experience was about transporting space from one place to the other, a way of dealing with cultural displacement. And I don't really get homesick, but I've noticed that I have this longing for this particular space and I want to recreate that space or bring that space wherever I go. So the choice of the material, which was fabric, was for many reasons. I had to make something that's light and transportable, something that you can fold up and put in a suitcase and bring with you all the time. Of his choice of fabric, the artist has also commented that a home is not only an architectural structure but harbours immaterial memories. That's why I chose thin, translucent fabrics. The thin fabric also reflects the porous boundaries between an individual's private life and the outside world. The artist's choice of silk is also interesting in that it was the material that symbolised the first historical trade route connecting the East and the West, the Silk Road. This mirrors Sue's own journey bringing his home from Korea to the US. Sue's nomadic style mirrors the general trend towards a globalised art world. Artists are constantly crossing borders to create and exhibit their work. Another Korean artist, Haig Yang, also calls attention to the nomadic lifestyle of the global artist. Yang decided to display the boxes that stored her work and materials in the gallery since there was a lack of storage space for her works and art supplies. Turning things around this way, the gallery became both the in-between passage space and the destination for the work, storage piece. Take a look at these photographs. How do they make you feel? What do they remind you of? Who do you think the photographer might have been? Pause here and have a chat about your initial ideas. In 1991, China loosened its adoption law. Since then, American families have adopted more than 55,000 Chinese children, almost all girls. The title of this series is Daddy and I. Zhang O oh uses the subject of stereotypes to confront those stereotypes. For such a seemingly simple father-daughter portrait, these images barely conceal a complex concoction of issues concerning race, culture, adoption, relationships, gender, migration, power. Think back to the previous lecture topic, Orientalism. 
When asked, how do these portraits make you feel? Did anyone say uncomfortable? These images reveal viewers' prejudices of what a family portrait should look like. At the same time, they draw on deeply ingrained stereotypes of Asian girls and women, of so-called China dolls, demure and cute and studious, and then as women, exotic, repressed, sexually compliant. As adolescents, the girls in these photographs exist between the two, and it's almost impossible to look at these photographs of Western men embracing or holding hands with young Chinese girls without calling to mind either one or the other, sometimes both simultaneously. Illegal or irregular immigration is a highly politicised issue and the subject of American artist Noelle Mason's body of work, X-ray vision vs invisibility. According to the artist, this work is informed by the socio-political climate of the Southern California border with Mexico and the imaging technologies used to uphold it. Ground control is a set of hand-woven rugs that depict a satellite image of the US-Mexico border. It was made in Mexico in exchange for the amount of money it would cost a family of four to illegally immigrate to the United States. Why do you think Mason chose to outsource the construction of the rug in exchange for that specific amount of money? The fact that the artist had outsourced the work in exchange for money alludes to the willingness of the West to outsource labour to less economically developed countries the movement of money and goods across borders, in direct contrast to the ever-increasing restrictions on the movement of people across borders. The area depicted in the image is the focal point of conflict and economic inequality. This is even more obvious when you know that the red of the image denotes cultivated agricultural land, whereas the green on the Mexican side of the border indicates arid, undeveloped land. Also part of this work are a series of cross-stitcheries that depict x-rays and infrared images of undocumented immigrants crossing the US-Mexico border illegally. Half were hand-sewn by Mason and half by an embroiderer based in Mexico, employed for the price of smuggling a single person into the US. Mason describes the cross-stitch as being an analogue version of pixelization. I feel like it translates something that's distinctly generated by a computer into something distinctly made by human hand. This process seems to contrast with the dehumanising effect of the technology. According to the artist, all of these works are concerned with the dehumanisation which is brought about by both the act of being surveilled and the aesthetics of machine vision. Moroccan-French artist Boukra Khalili investigates issues of migration, exile and displacement, as well as geography and borders. The Mapping Journey project combines all of these elements in a deceptively simple format. A hand traces a line across a map, while a voiceover tells a story of a journey. The project takes the form of eight videos on suspended screens. Each video documents the turbulent passage of an individual forced by their circumstances to travel illegally. Khalili found her subjects by immersing herself in cities known for being transitory points for migrants, including Marseille, Rome, Barcelona and Istanbul. After a lengthy conversation, she asked each of the participants to recount their journeys while drawing their routes with a permanent marker on a map each one taking anywhere from a few months to five years. Other journeys are short and stunted, such as the young man who travels from a fishing village in Algeria to a friend's flat in Marseille, where he is now stuck with no money, no job and no prospects. Or the convoluted route another young Palestinian man makes to East Jerusalem to see his girlfriend, a trip that would take no more than 15 minutes were it not for the distorted geography of occupation. So why do you think the artist chose to present these journeys in this particular way? What impact does the lack of a face have on the story being told? By deliberately concealing the faces of the individuals, 
The work subverts the forms of representation and vis visibility demanded by systems of surveillance, internal border control and the news media. According to the artist, those conversations participate in a process of empowerment. The narrators become the authors of their own narratives. By making them the protagonists of her videos, Khalili challenges the stereotypical representation of migrants in the mainstream media. The paired back format also demands the viewer to engage differently with the work, using their imagination to conjure the harrowing experiences. All of my works have in common to investigate how individuals with their own voices, with their own words, try to resist arbitrary boundaries and restrictive conceptions of identity and nation state. They speak with their own voice and through the process we engaged with, they became the author of their own narrative. There are, of course, people who are unable to cross borders and move freely. What about those living in exile, unable to return to the place of birth? What might home mean to those living in this state? Palestinian American Edward Said, who I mentioned in the history video for his theory of Orientalism, described exile as strangely compelling to think about, but terrible to experience. It's the unhealable rift forced between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home. Its essential sadness can never be surmounted. The reality of those living in exile is the subject of Palestinian American artist Emily Jassir's series, Where We Come From. Her American passport grants her the freedom of movement through her homeland that is denied to many Palestinians. Taking advantage of this, she asked more than 30 Palestinians, if I could do anything for you, anywhere in Palestine, what would it be? Requests ranged from the mundane, such as go to the Israeli post office in Jerusalem and pay my phone bill, to the personal, visit my mother, hug and kiss her, and tell her that these are from her son. One request reads, Go to my mother's grave in Jerusalem on her birthday and put flowers and pray. The text tells us that a man who made it lives a few kilometres away in Bethlehem, but was denied access to Jerusalem by the Israeli authorities. According to Jassir's footnotes, When I reached the grave of his mother, I was surprised to see a circle of tourists surrounding a grave nearby. It was the grave of Oscar Schindler, buried next to a woman whose son living a few kilometres away is forbidden from paying his respects without a permit. So why do you think this work is so poignant? Decades of conflict has resulted in the labyrinth of complexity that is Middle Eastern geopolitics. It can often seem overwhelmingly difficult to come to grips with the whole story and can feel foreign and far removed from our own comfortable reality. Jasir manages to make the topic accessible, engaging the viewer by drawing our attention to the small actions that we perform ourselves in our own lives, which we take for granted in their simplicity. This has a humanising effect on a deeply complex issue and engages us in the everyday reality of those living in exile.